I made over $100,000 in six months from trading penny stocks. Had I known then what I know now, I could have made a lot more. My name is Kevin Matheson, and I'm a former equity analyst at two of North America's largest funds. Just like with large cap growth stocks, there are good quality penny stocks and there are bad quality penny stocks. All that a penny stock even is, is a stock that trades under $5. It's as simple as that. Generally, you're investing in a Shark Tank or Dragon's Den sized deal with public financials and better liquidity. Now, of course, there are well-run small businesses with growing revenue, unique competitive advantages, great management teams, and then there's the other guys that are essentially fairy dust, promotion-driven companies with nefarious management teams preying on innocent and unknowing shareholders. And that's where the bad reputation comes from as portrayed perfectly in The Wolf of Wall Street. Penny stocks? In this video, I'll give you my six rules for trading penny stocks for beginners. After watching this entire video and following our rules, I guarantee you will never ever fall victim to any kind of penny stock scam, period. Now let me break down some context for you. Before I quit to start my own company, I completed the first level chartered financial analyst exam and Though most of what I learned is virtually useless for penny stock trading, everything I do is built on fundamental analysis wherever possible. As I walk you through my six rules, I'm going to use a real life example to illustrate how this can work in practice. As a slight disclaimer, not only is this not financial advice, but the trade I'm going to walk you through is a 35x, something that is absolutely an outlier just to illustrate what is possible. However, though a 35X is rarely seen, I have numerous two to five X returns, a handful better than that, which is still absolutely a market crushing return when compared to something like the S&P 500. Now let's dive in. Rule number one is to be active. The first thing you need to know about trading penny stocks for beginner is that you have to allocate time to pay attention. One of the biggest mistakes investors make when trading penny stocks is taking the buy and hold approach. Now that's great for more established companies with less volatility, though for any kind of growth stock, be it a penny stock, a small cap stock, or a large cap growth stock, that is absolutely not the way to go. Diversification is definitely key, and we're talking about that more in rule number four, but the general idea is that I'd rather have a relatively smaller number of companies that I can have high confidence in than a very large number that I can't keep track of. One of the biggest gifts and curses with penny stocks is the wild volatility, basically due to the fact that the bid and the ask prices are so spread. I remember one morning I woke up on vacation and this stock I've been following closely, which is the very good food company, was down 20%, which for any individual stock is a pretty shocking way to start the day. The first thing that came to mind is that they must have announced some terrible news. Now, I knew this company really well, and it didn't take me long to figure out that there actually was no news and nothing had changed fundamentally about the business in either a positive or a negative way. Something even more important that I noticed was that the trading volume of the day was relatively low. Immediately, a light bulb went off, and I was guessing that it was a rookie trading mistake. Now, when you're buying or selling a large cap stock like Apple, it really doesn't matter if you place a market order or a limit order. However, with penny stocks, a market order is one of the worst things you could possibly do because you can trigger a flash crash. On low volume stocks, many experienced traders will intentionally place low bids, hoping that somebody less experience will come in, click market sell, and their low bid will be filled immediately. When you place a market order, you're accepting whatever the active bid or ask price is, which can often be way different from what the market is currently trading at. And this is exactly what happened. Now, other investors realize this is what's happening. They actively bought these shares at about a 20% discount, and within hours, the stock had rebounded and was trading flat for the day. The active traders were able to get this stock for basically 20% off, even though there's nothing fundamentally negative that had been announced by the company. This is why being active is so important. Rule number two, don't hold forever. Every mega cap company from Tesla to Apple to Amazon at one point started as an early stage company. So inevitably, some penny stocks are gonna rise to absolute greatness. However, the simple fact is that most will not. Statistically speaking, the majority of small businesses fail in the first five years of business. And this is no different because ultimately remember we're investing in small businesses. You need to know when it's appropriate to buy the dip and when it's appropriate to lock in your gains. And it's actually not nearly as complex as you might think. My simple rule of thumb is this. If you see a stock jump significantly in price, ask yourself, has anything fundamentally changed in the business causing that spike? If not, I generally like to trim some of my position. The same is true in reverse. This isn't necessarily a hard rule, there's interpretation. But generally speaking, the higher a stock rises for uncertain reasons, the more likely I am to sell. Perhaps even more important is knowing when to give up entirely on a company. Investor psychology often makes it really hard for us to lock in a loss and exiting a position that's in the red. For most people, the loss doesn't become real until you click sell. But that's simply untrue, so don't throw good money after bad. If the tide is turning and a business is deteriorating, take your loss and move on. At its peak of $9 per share, I couldn't bring myself to sell the remaining 25% of my position in the very good food company because I was so attached to the company. I was still highly optimistic. And instead of fundamental analysis pointing towards the stock being overvalued, I couldn't bring myself to sell. My diamond hands chose to hold all the way down from $9 below my initial purchase price of 25 cents. This mistake alone cost me over $200,000. 
Rule number three, do your own research. Now, one thing that's particularly interesting about penny stocks is that the little guy can actually have somewhat of an advantage. Simply put, the majority of large institutions can't touch a stock that's below a market cap value of $300 million or below a share price of $5. This means the majority of media and analysts will simply never cover penny stocks. The negative aspect is that trading volume and liquidity will be a lot lower and worse. The positive aspect is that the little guy has a chance to find some of these promising companies before they're even on the radar of these institutions. Because there's either none or little media coverage of these companies, they'll often hire investor relations agencies to write articles, do digital marketing campaigns, push out newsletters, hire influencers, all kinds of things. There's nothing wrong with that, but you need to know when there's bias. Use YouTube, social media, email newsletters as inspiration, not as your source of due diligence. Now, each rule I share gets progressively more important, so stick around, because number five, I'm gonna talk about some real fundamental analysis that is relevant for penny stocks. Rule number four, diversify. We're just over halfway through, so we're gonna get to the really important stuff now, so stick around. Penny stocks are high risk, simple as that. But you need to have a different mindset because you're much more like an venture capitalist than you are a passive ETF investor. The portfolio approach of a venture capitalist is such that you buy 10 stocks, you think one or two of them are gonna go bankrupt completely. One or two of them are gonna absolutely knock it out of the park and the rest will just sit there and do nothing meaningful. However, the idea is that those wins are so significant that you don't even care about the rest of the portfolio. Now, again, I'm not your advisor, but I will stress that the majority of your portfolio should be in something boring like ETFs. That's how I manage it. ETFs and large cap stocks are a great way to preserve wealth, fight inflation, but they're just not a very good way to make money in the first place, unless your time horizon is like 30 or 40 years, which for a lot of people, it's just not. For me personally, I make money with penny stocks and private venture capital investments. I then take my profit and roll it into my large cap portfolio, which is for my retirement. I don't even check it. My large cap portfolio consists of 32 different companies in North America across a variety of sectors. And like I said, I check it very rarely. For penny stocks, there really is no magic number that dictates adequate diversification. However, as my simple rule of thumb, I find if I have 10 or more, I can't keep track and have high confidence in each one. If I have five or less, I just don't feel diversified enough. The worst thing that I hear is the most disturbing four words in the investing world. I'm going all in. The problem with trading penny stocks for beginners is that these kind of investments often attract gamblers, not investors. I spend a lot of time on Reddit and other forums like Yahoo Finance, and some of the comments I see are deeply disturbing. No matter how bullish you are or what kind of edge you think you have, pun intended, never go all in on a stock or even a few. This is one of the most important things you need to drill into your brain. Look, the first rule of investing is quoted by Warren Buffett is don't lose money. And diversification is the simplest way you can accomplish that. And look, the last comment I have on diversification is just because you have 10 plant-based stocks does not count as diversification. You need representation from multiple sectors. Let's say at least five. Rule number five, focus on the right fundamentals. Some of the most common ratios that analysts look at are completely irrelevant to penny stocks. Price to earnings, enterprise value to EBITDA, dividend yield, cash flow ratios, none of these matter. Okay, well, of course these matter, but just not necessarily in this case. The vast majority of these early stage companies are not even gonna have net income and they're definitely not gonna be paying out dividends, but I'm gonna argue that's actually a good thing. If an early stage company chooses to pay out a dividend, that means they don't have any internal opportunities that they can reinvest in that will create a larger return over time. And if the company itself is out of investment opportunities, I would be really worried about the long-term viability of that business. Apple computers didn't pay out a dividend until it was already one of the largest companies in the whole world. Amazon still doesn't pay a dividend. When a company hits its peak growth, becomes more slow and steady, then it's time to stick to business as usual and start paying out juicy dividends to shareholders. There are much more appropriate fundamentals to look for in penny stocks and venture capital investments. For example, do they have revenue? If they do, is it growing quickly? How fast? What's the quality of that revenue? Do they have tons of customers paying them recurring every month? Or are they doing lots of these random one-off transactions like consulting fees or asset sales, for example? Gross profit, also very important. Do they have juicy software size margins or are they in a competitive space like grocery store where margins are really limited. Now, net losses are also very common. It's more important to understand why the company is losing money than the fact that they are losing money. Are they investing heavily in growth through new facilities, research and development, clinical trials, synergistic acquisitions, or are they burning cash and excessive headcount, inflated executive salaries, and overly aggressive marketing campaigns? In the case of my investment in the Very Good Food Company, there was a bit of both going on. They were certainly investing in property, plant, and equipment. 
But also shareholders were quick to point out that executive salaries started getting a little bit high and their budget for marketing their e-commerce business, which unfortunately was a negative margin business, was starting to really take off and was eating through a massive amount of capital. When these initiatives didn't return the revenue they expected, shareholders started to freak out. Though there's many ratios that we can look at, the last thing I'll touch on is health of balance sheets. Now first, I always take a look at total assets over total liabilities, current assets over current liabilities, because it gives you a really quick snapshot of the health of a company. However, not all assets are created equal. Things like intellectual property, goodwill, those are really hard to value. Also inventory, just because a company has millions of dollars in product doesn't mean they're actually gonna sell it at full price or at all. I've seen many instances of public companies with millions of dollars of inventory, writing it down and selling it at pennies on the dollar. At the end of the day, cash is always king. There's no BSing the value of cash. Once I know the current cash balance, I always calculate the monthly burn rate. It's simple to do, you look at the quarterly statement, find the loss for the period, divide it by three, and that gives you a rough idea of your monthly burn rate. However, you do have to read between the lines a little bit. Some expenses over a quarter might not be recurring. Also, you might look for press releases from the companies that are perhaps a corporate update, pointing to certain cost savings initiatives so that you can finesse your monthly burn rate number a little bit. Take the amount of cash they have on hand, divide it by the monthly burn rate, and you'll get a good idea of when this company will need to finance again, thus diluting shareholders. Now, dilution is not a terrible thing if it A, keeps the company alive, and B, if they're using capital for something that'll be worth it in the long run. And here we are folks at the most important rule of all. Rule number six, don't fall for a pump and dump. The biggest reason penny stocks have a bad reputation is the unfortunately recurring instances of pump and dumps. Thanks a lot, Wolf of Wall Street. <laughs> the fact that a typical penny stock chart looks like a Christmas tree is no coincidence. Oftentimes they go up sharply and come back just as hard. But don't let that scare you away. It's actually really easy to spot when this is gonna happen. First things first, you look at the share structure. Now this is something I spent a ton of time on now. However, when I was an analyst, it was way less relevant for large cap companies. When you look at the share structure, you wanna look back at previous financings. Who invested, when, at what price per share, and what is the timeline that dictates the lockups? With penny stocks, it's very common to see a large number of shares priced significantly below the IPO price. Founders of the company will almost always have millions of shares that were priced at half a penny, which is virtually nothing. However, as founders of the company, that's not such a big deal. They've poured blood, sweat, and tears into this company, so they've paid for their shares in a different way. They're not even investors, they're builders. What you really need to look for is, are there cheap shares in the hands of people who are not reporting insiders? Because they'll be able to sell their shares without filing any insider trading reports. If the delta in the current market price and the cheap shares is large, you can almost guarantee there's gonna be some kind of selling activity from non-insiders. However, for that to be possible, their shares would have to be free trading. What that means is that any of these lockup restrictions will have to have been lifted. Shares become free trading over a certain length of time. And if you wanna find that out, you look in the company's prospectus, which is a detailed financial document that has to be submitted as part of an initial public offering. Typically, early shares will unlock slowly over the course of three years, but it does depend on what exchange you're trading. However, knowing that these shares will become free trading and selling pressure will likely increase, companies will go heavy on investor marketing. Because the total number of shares that are free trading are initially restricted because of these lockups, if the company lays on marketing, it can often send the stock quite a bit higher. But once the shares become free trading and selling pressure increases, often you'll see the stock price come right back down. Now, when this happens, it's not inherently a scam or even a necessarily bad thing. Investor relations is incredibly important for these early companies. What really distinguishes a pump and dump is some kind of nefarious intention. The marketing material might be very forward looking and might draw some ridiculous comparisons of this company being the next giant corporation, and it might provide wildly optimistic outlooks on future revenue. At their worst, they can be fully fraudulent. The best way you can protect yourself is number one, do your own research and don't blindly trust the views of others. And two, don't put too much weight in forward looking statements as oftentimes they don't actually come out to be accurate. There are always exceptions to this rule. Back to our example of the very good food company, you might look at forums and look at the stock price and say that this was obviously a pump and dump. Though the shares were clearly pumped and clearly dumped, I personally don't believe there's anything illegal or unethical going on. Every so often a stock hits the market at the exact right time and takes off. And that's what happened to Vary. Beyond Meat was hitting all-time highs. Sales of vegan products were taking off. Documentaries like Game Changers on Netflix were bringing a massive amount of interest to the space. And aside from Beyond, there were no other public companies to invest in until Vary. Vary hit the market at the perfect opportunity. And at the same time, it was right in the middle of a retail investor boom. The company was selling products like crazy to seemingly endless demand. And tons of influencers fell in love with the company and started promoting it for free. 
because so many passionate vegans bought the stock for emotional reasons, a lot of these guys were first time investors, didn't necessarily know anything about research and analysis. At one point, the market cap was hundreds of times current revenue. Once Beyond Meat shares started to fall and Vary started to post some significant losses, momentum turned extremely fast and the stock dropped like a rock. In spite of my background as an analyst, I didn't sell all of my position. I love the company. I still consume their products. I support the industry overall. And I had faith that they'd hit these lofty objectives. So I held tight to the remaining 25% of my position and that mistake cost me over $200,000. With that said, I followed my other rules and I was sure to lock in profits exactly as I listed in this video. And if you follow these rules, I'm confident that you can make your money too. Guys, if you enjoyed this video and found it useful, I'd love for you to give it a like and subscribe. Give us a comment too if you have any questions and if there's any other videos you'd like us to cover, let us know and I look forward to seeing you again next time.